This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Fields of Despair. Fields of Despair was released in 2017 by GMT Games and designed by Kurt Lewis Keckley. This game supports up to two players and takes about three hours to play. Welcome back to the Harsh Rules Breakdown for Fields of Despair. Let's begin this episode by looking at the game's turn track. Fields of Despair is played over nine turns. Each turn is divided into two turn spaces, one for each action phase. Turns run the course of the war from 1914 to 1918. Several spaces trigger significant changes or exceptions to the game's rules. The first space is the Central Powers opening move. This allows the Central Powers to complete one action phase and invade Belgium. During this opening move, the Central Powers are not allowed to move blocks or place air squadron or artillery counters into any French hex. The Allies may not play air squadron or artillery counters or use logistics points. Optionally, the Central Powers may elect to forego the opening move altogether. At that point, the turn marker enters the first space for 1914, and the game proceeds from there. From turn 2, aerial dogfighting becomes an option. Prior to this, only aerial reconnaissance is allowed. Trench warfare begins on turn 4. From this point on, every hex space on the board is considered to contain a trench. And, although it's not marked, turn 7 is the Bolshevik Revolution. Any Central Powers forces that have survived their engagement on the Eastern Front return to the Western Front as reinforcements. Depending on the scenario being played, the United States may also enter the war at this point, or earlier. The playbook contains five scenarios for the game. Scenario 1 is the introductory scenario, and spans the first three turns of the game, but excludes the Central Powers opening move. This scenario is designed to acclimate players to the basic concepts of the game. Scenario 2, The Mobile War, begins with the Central Powers opening move into Belgium, then continues for three turns. This is the period of rapid movement before the trenches are dug and the stalemate begins. Scenario 3, The Great Stalemate, is described as a three-turn chess match as players search for then try to exploit a weak spot in the enemy lines. With both sides dug in, combat favors the defender. After that, Scenario 4, The Final Push, brings the war to a close. The Central Powers, emboldened by the fall of Russia, have one last offensive in them, while the Allies, bolstered by the arrival of the Americans, begin the final push to expel the Hun from France. Finally, the playbook also offers Scenario 5, The Grand Campaign. This scenario begins with the Central Powers opening move and continues through all nine turns. For this rules breakdown, we will be using Scenario 1 as the basis for our examples. Scenario 1 begins on page 10 of the playbook and continues to page 11. There are several tables shown on both pages related to a specific piece of setup. Let's begin by setting up the main board by using the tables on page 11. Fields of Despair uses an alphanumeric coordinate system to plot positions on the map. The vertical axis is numbered 1 through 10, and the horizontal axis is lettered A through M. On the setup tables, such as the one for the central powers, this can be found in the far left column. Now, starting from the far right column of this table, place the control markers to establish the central powers front line. The next column over from this is for the Central Powers Forts. CP stands for Central Powers, and the number indicates the strength of the fort. I place the fort markers over the top section of the city icons. Be aware, there are locations on the map that straddle two hexes. For the Central Powers player, this is M7 and M8. Place one fort here for both hexes. The final two columns list the strength points for infantry and cavalry blocks. Hexes like H2 with a strength of 37 will require multiple blocks. 
The stacking limit is three blocks for one hex. A player uses blocks to meet these values however they like. Just remember, a player is limited to the set block inventory of their force pool. Following the same process, the allied player will set up their side of the board. The difference here is that they're setting up three armies, the largest being the French army, the British army, and then the Belgian army. The US army will enter the war later in the game. Now that we've set up the game's map, we're going to need this table on page 10. Next, we're going to set up the allied player board. I'll be explaining the rules as we go along. The player board contains several tracks mainly related to artillery, aircraft, and supply. First, let's discuss all things artillery. A player may never have more than six artillery tiles at a time. The allied player begins the introductory scenario with five artillery tiles as noted on the player board setup table. One zero strength bluff tile, two one strengths, a single two strength, and a three strength. The total strength of all these tiles is seven. The total strength of artillery allowed is shown on the artillery maintenance track. The introductory scenario places the allied player's artillery strength at 10. The key rule here is that a player's total artillery strength may never exceed the number on this track. To complicate matters, every turn this track will degrade by one point. This will require players to spend some of their economic point cubes on maintenance. Economic points are the game's currency. Players receive these points in the form of cubes to spend on maintenance and technology upgrades, among other uses. The allied player must spend at least one economic point cube to maintain their artillery level. If a player allows their artillery maintenance level to drop below their total artillery strength, in our example 7, then that player must break down their artillery tiles into lower strength ones to meet the new level. On the other hand, during the production phase, players can spend their economic point cubes to build up their artillery. They can add more points to their artillery maintenance track. This will allow them to support more tiles with greater strength. They can spend one economic point cube to place a new value one tile on the player board, up to a maximum of six tiles, including the bluff tile. They may also spend an economic point to increase the strength of an existing tile. For example, a strength one tile can be upgraded to a strength two tile. The maximum strength of an artillery tile is four. The zero bluff tile cannot be upgraded to a one or replaced with a one strength tile. It always serves as a zero strength bluff and occupies one of the total six artillery tile positions. Finally, players may use economic points to advance the technology of their artillery to enable the use of chlorine or mustard gas. This allows artillery to make a gas hit on a die result of four. To counter gas attacks, economic point cubes can be spent to fund gas mass technology. Gas mass negate artillery die results of four. Each technology space shows two numbers. The first is the number of gas hits negated for chlorine gas. The second number is for mustard gas. Next, let's discuss aircraft. Aircraft rules for the player board have some similarities to artillery, but overall are treated very differently. A player may never have more than six air squadron tiles. The allied player begins the introductory scenario with all six air squadron tiles as noted on the player board setup table one zero strength bluff tile, and five one strength tiles. The total strength of all these tiles is five. The air maintenance track tells the player the maximum total strength of air squadron tiles allowed in play. In the introductory scenario, the allied player's air maintenance track allows a total strength of five. This track also degrades by one point every turn. Therefore, the allied player should invest at least one economic point cube right away to maintain their aircraft maintenance level. As for technology, players can invest in aircraft improvements. Advancements along this track bolster air squadrons in several ways. Air squadrons have their own force pool of tiles. 
By investing in aircraft improvements, larger strength tiles become available. However, there is a limited number of each strength type. Therefore, air squadrons are managed more like blocks than artillery tiles which are upgraded individually. A player manages their six air squadron tiles within these force pool type parameters. They can use the strength tiles they've unlocked from aircraft improvements, but must always include the zero strength bluff tile. And the tiles they use must be within the total strength allowed by the air maintenance track. Next, at level four, players can unlock their ace squadron. For the allies, this is Henri Fonk. For the central powers, it's the Red Baron. Both ace squadrons have a strength of two. However, what makes these squadrons special is that they may re-roll one die per dogfight. Finally, air improvement levels may award a one-time air maintenance track bonus. As a result, it may make more sense to invest in aircraft improvements rather than putting economic points directly to the maintenance track. Before we move on to supply, let's quickly cover off on tanks. Once trench warfare occurs, breakouts can only be conducted by spending a tank tile. However, first players will need to advance their tank technology to level three. When a player reaches level three during a production phase, they immediately receive one free tank tile. Additional tank tiles may be purchased at a cost of one economic point each. The number in the space indicates the block strength that may break out per tile. The higher the tank level, the higher the block strength that can break out per tile. These same rules apply for the Central Powers player, except their tiles are themed as Staatstruppen. While we're here, we might as well discuss the other two spaces in this corner. The first is for storing unused economic point cubes. A player may roll over up to three unspent cubes to the next turn. The second space is unique to the allied player. This space is for tracking Belgian bribes. Belgian bribes is an optional rule for advanced play. These optional rules allow players to explore alternate history and new mechanics. In this case, Belgium remains neutral if the Central Powers player doesn't invade them. To move blocks through neutral Belgian spaces, the Allied player needs to roll a 6. The Allied player can use economic points to pay bribes and increase their chances of success. Pages 21 and 22 of the rulebook are dedicated to these optional rules. Once you're comfortable with the main game, check them out. Next, let's discuss supply. The supply capacity track indicates the number of hexes with blocks that can be supplied. The allied player can supply 17 hex spaces. This is another track that loses a point every turn and players will need to invest economic point blocks to keep it stable or increase it. However, be aware, if supply is increased past the 21 space, the track loses two points per turn until it drops below the 20 space again. Let's talk a little more about how supply works. Hex spaces with blocks receive their supplies from a player's edge of the board. The allied supply source starts from the left side of the board, the central powers the right side. As we just saw, the allied player can supply 17 hex spaces. However, when the game begins, they have blocks and only 10. These hexes must be able to trace a supply line from their position back to their own board edge. The border of supply is defined by the control markers, essentially the front line. Supply lines can be cut in two ways. First, hex spaces with blocks that fall behind the enemy line or are surrounded by enemy control markers are considered out of supply. Second, if the number of hex spaces with blocks exceeds the supply capacity, those excess spaces are out of supply. The player controlling those forces decides which hex spaces do not receive supplies. If a hex space with friendly blocks loses supply, place an out of supply marker on the space to keep track of it. Out of supply hex spaces are impacted in several ways. First, the player cannot use logistic points in that hex. Second, 
Blocks in an out of supply space may only move one space per action phase and they can only move towards the board edge of their supply. Third, when blocks attack from an out of supply space, they do so with only half of their dice rounded down. And finally, an out of supply hex cannot be used to allocate artillery. Fortresses can also provide a limited amount of supply. A fort can supply blocks at twice its strength. For example, a fortress with a strength of 4 can supply up to 8 strength points of blocks. Finally, let's discuss logistic points. The allied player begins the game with 3 logistic points. More logistic points can be purchased during the production phase. Once purchased, they are tracked on the player board until they are spent. At the end of a turn, unspent logistic points carry over to the next turn. Logistic points can be used in the following ways. As we discussed in the last episode, a logistic point can be spent to reinforce or retreat. During the action phase, at the start of block movement, a player can also spend a logistic point to conduct an emergency reorganization. We're going to talk about strategic reorganization more in the next episode. Essentially, it allows the active player to make a long-range block movement with up to 5 strength points. These blocks must move before any other blocks and may not move again during the formal block movement step. If moved to a contested hex, these blocks may participate in combat in any subsequent breakout move. Emergency reorganization can only be conducted twice per action phase. A logistic point used exclusive to the Central Powers player is to use their Big Bertha artillery piece as a railgun. As a railgun, Big Bertha can concentrate her firepower on a single fortress. Traditional artillery fire only assigns the first hit to a fortress. The rest go to blocks until all blocks are removed. But Big Bertha, acting as a railgun, can potentially hit a fortress with all four of her dice. The Central Powers player can only use Big Bertha as a railgun once per action phase. A logistic point can also be spent to conduct aircraft repair during the action phase's refresh air step. This allows a player to remove two points of damage and immediately add that value back to their air maintenance track. There is no limit to the number of times this can be done. Finally, a logistic point can be spent to resupply during any phase. With this action, the player can remove an out of supply marker from one hex provided the hex has a current supply line. In other words, if the hex is behind enemy lines or surrounded by enemy control markers, this will not work. And now that we've set up the player board, this is a good place to stop for this episode. Keep in mind, while I've only showed the allied player board setup, the player board setup for the central powers follows the same process. Just reference their side of the setup table and you're good to go. In the next episode of this Harsh Rules Breakdown for Fields of Despair, we're going to set up and learn the rules for the Eastern Front, Naval Warfare, the U.S. Entry Track, and the General Records Track. This setup will take us through the other phases of gameplay. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this is Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.